Welcome back everybody. Steve Basic, architect here, and we are episode number 10. And this is our PH, standing for Passive House, 11 series. The reason for 11 is this was a house I designed in 09, we constructed in 10, and we certified in 2011. Yeah, <clears throat> if you haven't seen the uh, first nine videos, I suggest you go check those out. And uh, <clears throat> we're on episode 10 here. They do kind of follow a thought process, and there's some linkage to the different episodes. So viewed as a series, it is the best bet, but I also try to make them that if you want to catch one or two of them, they're still certainly takeaways. So anyways, episode 10. I call this one the green box. We'll put it in green. And it has something to do with the red line test, but you'll understand why I call it the green box episode here as we move along. So let's uh, get underway. Yeah, don't you just love this vibe board? So if you're wondering, I have a stylus here. It has two buttons and I can control kind of the slideshow on those two buttons. So when I turn around and it goes, I'm not hitting any buttons there. I'm manually controlling it here. Anyways, here's our building section. You saw this in, I think it was like episode three or something like that, episode two. But I just wanted to reiterate, right? Joe, better known as Dr. Joe from Building Science Corporation or BSC, right? Years ago, he came out and he proposed a very simple concept. He said you should be able to take a red pen, you should be able to drop it on the drawing, and you should be able to trace the air barrier. And not only should you be able to trace the air barrier, it should close on itself. And this is the red line test. And I don't care who you heard it from, who you heard it by, I know for a fact that the red line test, that's Joe's. That is all him. And it doesn't matter where the section is taken. Um, you should be able to do it in floor plan too. Um, you know, no matter where you're cutting a building, I mean, remember a floor plan is no, nothing more than a horizontal section. A building section is a vertical section. So both of them delineate the red line test. And the red line test is very simple. Not only should it be continuous, and I know, I know I'm harping on this. For, for those of you that have seen the nine, we've already talked about this, but I harp on it. Why? Because I travel around the country, I go look and walk different projects, different builders, architects, etc., etc., problem buildings. And the hardest, one of the hardest concepts for the building industry to wrap their head around, I know as simple as it may seem, we have this red line, and I'm going to highlight it here. All right? We have that highlighted red line. And this is the problem the industry has. We cannot tell the difference between outside and inside. But that line, that is the demising line, everything. On this side of that line is inside. Everything on that side of that line is outside. It's not the thermal boundary. It's not the vapor boundary. It's not the water management, WRB. It's not that. It is your primary air barrier. And that primary air barrier should be continuous. Should go around the building. Now, in some places, that air barrier is the glass on the window. 
In this case here, it is our WRB. In this case here, it is our slab. So when people ask, hey, what's the air barrier on that project? It all depends on where you're cutting the section and what you're looking at. Because even at the window, it could be a piece of expanding foam. Right? Expanding foam sealant. It could be tape. There. You don't know. It could be gypsum wall board. In this case, it's on the ceiling, but gypsum board. Right? Um, and we're going to show how we use that on this project here. But the, the basic fundamentals, and it really isn't that hard. You know, one of my favorite quotes of Joe's is, he would, I, I probably heard him say it almost every day. It's not rocket science. It's building science. And to dumb that down and make it the simplest concept, like you're either inside or outside. I can't tell you how many times I've walked through buildings with an architect or builder and said, okay, where we're standing now, are we inside the building or outside the building? And I couldn't tell. It was not defined. Because they thought they had it defined. They're like, well, we're kind of inside because we have this. But I'm like, look at this whole truss arrangement is wide open to the attic of the garage. That suggests that I'm outside. So it is that simple. If you're designing a house, if you're building a house, if you're a do-it-yourselfer and you're general contracting your own house, you need to answer the question, am I inside or am I outside? And you better be able to answer it. So, the big green box, here you have it. This project here, you might have heard me talk about it, where the window delivery was absolutely horrendous. Yes, we waited for weeks to get our windows. They're coming next week. Um, next week could come and go, and oh, we need three more weeks. Three more weeks could come and go, we need two more weeks. So, I talked to the builder and I said, you know, Zip was in its infancy. Remember, this house was designed in 2009 and constructed in 2010, right? So, Zip wall system was in its infancy. It, this is the very first project I ever used it on, and I didn't know a lot about it. So, I talked to the builder, I said, you know what, why don't we just sheath the whole building? with zip and then we can run a test and we'll actually test the green box I was calling it. So the green box is nothing more than our red line. Right? And this is before windows, this is before um, installing insulation. It is just the green box. And if you're looking for those blower door numbers um, I think it was episode uh, two where I go through all of the numbers of the house. So go watch that episode. You can uh, catch up. But it was extremely airtight. Like it was, you know, a quarter of passive houses, 0.6. So the reality is, is the green box tight? Yes. Hell yes. We can make it very, very tight, but we have to pay attention to the details. Um, and you could see we did... A smoke test. We had our theatrical fogger out there. Not only did we do a blower door, but we filled the house with smoke. We turned the fan around. We pressurized it to probably close to uh, 100 pascals when we walked around. We did find a couple areas of leakage under here. And that's where we relied on closed cell spray foam as the air barrier on that roof. It wasn't a lot. It wasn't a lot. You can see the number here. We're pushing 25 CFM 50. Um, which is pretty much nothing, especially given that a large portion of that was probably air leakage around the shroud itself. But uh, anyways, let's press on. Oh, sorry. So, this one just takes a while to come up because this is a graphic um, that I use quite often in my lecture series. Um, you know, if you're familiar with the thermal bypass checklist, I'll write that up here. So if you're familiar with the thermal bypass checklist, all this is, is Video, but 
thought I had that off. Um, anyways, the thermal bypass checklist. All this is is a graphic version of the thermal bypass checklist. So you can see I've highlighted all of the areas that we would be concerned. So the green box, I would say build the green box and then add everything to it, right? So what does that mean? It means if we're putting on a garage here and we have this demising line here where we have this whole wall, then we want to build this and we want to make sure that we maintain continuity across that line and then we want to add this appendage. The same with here. If this is a screen and porch, this area here where the two share a wall, we want to make sure that we maintain continuity there and around the corner. And then we add this appendage to that. We have areas of skylights, walls, penetrations through the ceiling, if that's our air barrier. We have our attic access hatch, notoriously for being a uh, air leakage spot. Soffits that are open to the attic. Band joist areas there. Can, um, not cantilevers, but soffits, yes, and cantilevers, where we have that surface, where we have to maintain continuity down, across, down the wall, and across, right? It's that whole red line test. It doesn't matter where I pick a line in this building. Um, I should be able to do a red line test down across that building, and it should close on itself and it should be continuous, right? This is a just a really good graphic, I think, that helps you see there's a whole bunch of problem areas, but the basic concept here is build the inside, right? The primary air barrier, build the red line. In this case, build the green box, whatever you want to call it, but build that primary air barrier and then attach everything to it. So. Let's look at a few photos of stuff. Um, in this house here, you know, it has a double wall assembly. So we have a wall here and we have a wall here. So this is what I call a micro vestibule. So it's basically two doors. Um, the reason we did two doors with the airspace is this door, we the homeowner wanted you know, kind of a real door, and all we could get at best was roughly about R3, which in a passive house at the time was not really the best um, situation. Could we get away with that today? Probably in the calculations. We could make up for it somewhere else along the building. Um, but in this case, we actually had our window manufacturer make us patio doors. And these units are probably somewhere in like an R6 range. So between that door, the airspace here in our vestibule, and the R3 there, our wall here is kind of creeping northward to a satisfactory moment. Um, but one of the things that I think is the coolest about this, because the house was so tight, right, we're talking... I mean, before we put windows in, um, <clears throat> we were probably at 0.16. But even after the windows were in, we were at point, I think it was like 5.7 or so, <clears throat> which is tight. Because of that airspace, I could take that outer door and try and slam it. And it would get to like within two inches of closing, and then it would kind of bounce back. The reason is... When you compress that air, we couldn't evacuate it fast enough, but there's no place in the house for that air to go either. Because the house is so airtight, it couldn't respond quick enough. And so the air inside here would simply push the door back as it was trying to capture the air, and it would kick the door back. So even when you went to close it, you'd have to close it, you'd get to two inches, you'd have to wait a second for the air to equalize, the pressure to equalize across the door, and then you could slowly close it. 
Um, you know, down at the uh, band joist or down at the uh, slab mud sill area, you can see here we have our um, slab. And you can see this big black goop of stuff and we wrap it around the bolt. We put it there, we put it at the joint and then it goes there. There is actually another one underneath here. And then we put our mud sill down on top of that. Now, you can see we have our ice and water shield there. The uh, gentleman that was the passive house consultant on this project was in fear that the concrete slab um, wasn't good enough to be the air barrier. Um, and he certainly didn't appreciate it when I told him to kneel down and try and blow through it. Um, but, you know, there's certain battles we fight and certain battles we kind of give in. So we ended up putting ice and water shield on the slab and sealing to it. Um, this is a Tremco product and it is acoustical sealant. The reason I like it, um, guys refer to it as the Black Death. Um, and the reason for that is if you get it on something, it's the death of you. You might as well throw the jacket away, the shirt away, the gloves, whatever, the tool, you are not getting it off. The beauty of that stuff is it stays elastic for its lifetime. Um, you know, we're, we're what, 14, 14 years displaced from this. I would guarantee if we went and we opened up the house and we pulled up that mud sill, we would get this stringy, black, gooey bunch of Black Death across there, so. Primary air barrier. You can see here, zip tape. He's got a roller. What am I going to say? Roll the tape. You know, maybe I'll do a version on um, wedding. For those of you not familiar with it, we can uh, maybe add that to the series. And we can talk about what exactly wedding is. Um, <clears throat> and insert that. But basically, the surface of that has what I call micro contours, right? It is not. Let's see if I can draw it here. We'll draw it in blue, right? If I drew the surface of that, it would look like this. It is not like that, right? It's like this. So now if I take tape and I stretch tape across here, right, pretty much I would get pretty close to, let's say, 90% plus bonding. But if I take the tape and I stretch it across here, right, you could see, I have no idea what happened here, you could see that there are a number of voids there, 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 there. And the reason for that is you need to roll the tape. Because if I roll the tape, then I'm pushing that tape against those contours. And instead of getting, say, 60% contact area, I'm going up to you know, let's say 95% plus. And have I seen the tape flailing? When we first started using zip, you drive up to a project, this stuff would be like a kite in the wind. And I would ask the guys, oh, did you roll it? And, oh, you're supposed to roll that stuff? We just put the tape up and ran our hand down it. No, you have to roll it because you have to induce the wetting process and the wetting process gets that adhesive down into that micro contour and really gives it the bite that it needs. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about that uh, that wetting process. We have I, we talk about that as a maybe a bonus episode to this series. But roll the tape, literally. Um, here's one of the you know cool pictures of build the green box. So green box. Notice. There's a joist hanger, and that's holding our truss. Our truss does not penetrate our primary air barrier. 
it sits on the outside of it. Now, some of you are going to sit there and say, well, what about the nails and this and that? Well, they're going into blocking and such back there. And again, we made passive house blower door numbers on here. So those holes, it may seem like they're a lot, but they're going into wood. They're not going into the living room, right? And where that air is going to be um, just subjected to freedom on the inside. Those of you that say, okay, well, you know, and I, I've heard all these stories. There's going to be those that say, well, what about in five years when, you know, the WRB, um, the OSB shrinks and stuff around the nail and now you have an opening? We have a number of houses that we've gone back to and done subsequent blower doors, one of which I think we've done three or four on, and the number hasn't changed in close to probably nine, almost ten years. So, um, you know, and even if it did, even if we went, right, do the math, even if we did went from our 0 0.60, in this case we we're at 0 0.57, and we got some added air leakage, and that went to 0 0.85, would you consider that a failure? I wouldn't. I would say, hey, that's the cost of doing business with those materials, right? So... On the inside, one of the other things that we did that was a little different is our green box needed a ceiling. And in this case, it was the second floor ceiling. Now, as an architect, one of the things that I took away from one of my teachers in college was, you know, he would always say, if I can get one thing to do two things, then I have its cost, right? Because now it has, it's doing this and that, not just this. And it means that I don't have to buy something else to do that. So what do I mean by that? The drywall, right? It's the finish. It's my ceiling plane. But now I've made it part of my air barrier. All right? So it's doing this and that. <clears throat> and the way it does that is... We framed up our walls, we put our roof truss on, we put our metal roof on the house, and then we had the drywaller come in, and notice there are no interior partitions here, right? They're not here yet. We had the drywaller come before we did the interior partitions, do the whole ceiling, and um, then we had the interior partitions come, uh, or the framer come back and frame up the interior part of that. We also minimized the amount of holes and, you know, lights and such from that so that on the back side we could go up and we could treat the back side of that penetration of an electrical box at a smoke detector or at some limited lights very, very easily um, from there. So, anyways, um, you know, this was uh, the first time we did that. We've done this a number of times on projects and it always works. I know again there's people out there that will sit there and say you can't use drywall as an air barrier. It'll crack. Okay? Again, if we're at 0.57 ACH50. Right? And that's with drywall that I had to buy anyway. So all I'm doing is saying if we, if we take it a little out of sequence and we don't do the interior walls, we could use the drywall as our air barrier. And then we don't have to buy an air barrier because we're going to just use it for this and that. Right? So if we're at 0.57, which meets the 0 0.60 of a passive house, and say we get some cracks in the drywall. We haven't, but just let's say if we did, and that 0 0.7 goes to 0.80. 5.7 to 0.80 ACH 50, right? When most of the houses in America are probably being built to 3 to 5, and that's 3.0, 5.0, 0.8, right? So even if it cracked a little and I ended at 0 0.8, it's somewhere around 25 to maybe, or 10 to 25% of what we're actually building out there. Yeah, 15 to 
of what we're actually building out there on a commodity basis. So it's still one hell of a house. So I wouldn't get too wrapped up in it. Um, and again, we've used the ceiling air barrier trick a number of times. We've gone back and done blower door tests. So I'm kind of tired and I'm beyond that argument. It works. It works well. We can make it work. So I use it. Anyways, that is the top side of our green box, All right? So we had our primary air barrier, we had our slab down below, our wall here, that is the sixth side of our green box. And we put the insulation on the outside. Remember, insulation's on the outside because this line of drywall, this is in, this is out. There's not a place in this house that we can't go. You ask that question and I'll tell you, like that, whether we're in or out. It is that simple. I'll leave you with Joe's quote. It's not rocket science. It's building science. So, hopefully you enjoyed that. I'm Steve Basic Architect. This is my vibe board. Um, quick note about the vibe board. You know, I think it's certainly up my game here in presentations. Please put some remarks in. I'd love to hear what you guys think about using the vibe board and being able to, you know, switch around on these presentations. But, you know, it, it has a camera. We can do Zoom calls here. We can have interactive meetings with clients all over the country um, in the office. It's not I mean, it's a great tool for what I'm using it for here as a, a presentation tool. But as a general tool in the office, if I'm a builder and I have eight employees and every Friday, every second Friday of the month, we have an internal meeting where we review something. Well, this is basically our instruction board, right? It's a smart instruction board where we could bring up a set of drawings from an architect. We can go through them just like I did here. We could bring up some photos of something we did wrong and we could talk about it. If we're doing a safety class, we can go to the website of the safety harness and review their documentation. I mean, this is a tool that is far beyond what I'm using it for. Now, like I said, it's a game changer for me, but if you're in an office environment and you have other employees, or if you work by yourself, this is great. I could sit here and sketch out ideas, move things around, uh, just have a real quick go at it. It's an endless piece of sketch paper. So anyways, go check it out. Um, I'm a contributor on the Build Show Network. You guys know that. Go check that out. Literally, I have hundreds of videos. And... The cool thing about the build show, it's everybody's favorite word. All the information there is free. Yes, you can go there, you can watch all of my videos, and you still got money to buy popcorn and beer. You got it, and, and possibly even a new couch. So, Unbuild It Podcast, yeah, and we're under the build show umbrella. So you can find us there, but you can find us on Spotify and iTunes, and all of those, and you can find us on our own YouTube channel at the Unbuild It Show, where you can watch all of our antics behind the scenes, me, Peter, and Jake, and uh, have at it. If you're still looking for more, you can find me on Instagram at Steve Basic Architect, LinkedIn at Steve Basic, Facebook, Steve Basic Architect, TikTok, and of course, you found me here on YouTube. Go tell all your friends, and tell them to smash that subscribe button. Um, before I go, again, I'm just going to ask you nicely, if you would, put some comments down below. Let me know, Vibe Board, if you like this series, Going Back in Time. I think it's, um, it's a fantastic voyage to go back in time to see what I did, recollect why I did some things, and then possibly talk about how I would change it, how I would do it today. Um, you know, if we built this house today, it would still be kind of thought as a spaceship, right? So it really hasn't lost its relevancy, even though it's 14 years. And I learned a ton 
um, from doing this project and I'm hopefully going to share it with you so that you can share in that learning a ton too. Anyways, that's it for today. That's the Green Box episode. Until next time, long live our building.